Fun. Okay, so one can work in some generalities, but um, instead I want to focus on something extremely concrete. Let's, as our setup, take a curve inside y1 cubed, where y1, just like before, is the modular curve, is the upper half plane mod s to z, or equivalently, it's the moduli space of all elliptic curves. Man, the microphone feels more powerful today. Somehow I can feel it ringing in my ears. Um, okay. And so for special point problems, it'd be enough to look at a curve in y1 squared because the generic rank is two and we're dropping by more than two. If we want to do something beyond that, um, we have to look at y1 cubed. So let's begin by um, recalling what the appropriate notion of rank is in this setting of sort of complexity. For the rank zero points, well, the rank zero points are the easiest. They're just the CM points. Where the ZI are all CM. And what about the rank one points? Those are the ones that will concern us the most. So remember, what does rank mean? It means you remove all CM points, and then you look at how many isogeny orbits you have. So in this case, we have three uh, possibilities. First of all, we can have Z1, Z2, and Z3 all isogenous. I'm going to use this symbol here to mean isogeny. And the ZI not CM. That's one type of um, rank one point. Then we can have one of them be CM and the other two be isogenous. That's um, another type of rank uh, of rank one point. And finally, I'm getting this right. We can have two of them be CM and the third one not. So in this case, Z2 is not CM and Z3 is not CM. And of course, we can permute the coordinates as well. Okay, so these are the three types of rank one points that we have. And the zilber pin conjecture in this instance says that if we look at, so assume C is not contained in a special proper special sub variety. So what does that mean in this case? It's very concrete. It just means, um, first of all, that no two, that, that no coordinate on C is constant. It's actually moving in all three coordinates. And secondly, it means that no two coordinates are generically isogenous. So it's projection to two coordinates is not just some Hecke curve. That's all it means in that case. <clears throat> So let me just make that clear. So this means, so IE no ZI is constant and no ZI, ZJ are generically isogenous. But then the theorem in this case, or sorry, the conjecture in this case is that if you look at the points in C, which are rank at most one, then this is finite. And again, what's motivating our conjecture? Well, we have one degree of freedom here. So we can, typically the rank is three for an arbitrary point. We can make the rank two by forcing two coordinates to be isogenous or by making one of them be CM, but making it drop below two is unlikely. And so the natural conjecture is that it doesn't happen. And if it did happen, it would happen for a reason that we've ruled out, that C is contained inside some special variety like this. Okay, so this is still open. Kind of frustratingly, or 
Maybe it's good. I guess it's good to have problems to work on. I'm sorry, say that again, please. Yeah, in the general case, you can define it with Mumford-Tate groups or with intersections with special varieties. Um, that's right. Mm -hmm. I think in the most general setting where you don't even have that, the best definition is with special varieties because that somehow makes sense in any setting where you have a bialgebraic kind of setup. The Mumford-Tate group is a little bit special, but of course you're right, in all concrete cases, you can use that. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to explain in some detail the proof of the following theorem due to Habegger and Pila. Which says, assume the following, I really like this assumption. There's this cute assumption that the degrees, I mentioned this last time, the degrees in all three coordinates are distinct. So what does that mean? One easy way to say it is if you look at the degree of pi i for i equals one, two, and three, that's a projection from c to y1. It's going to have some degree because it's an algebraic curve. I want these all to be distinct. Okay, then uh, this conjecture is true. Okay, so um, basically I want to spend most of this lecture, we'll see how long it takes, uh, just proving this. <clears throat> so let's um, begin by noticing the problem. So what are the issues? So let's recall what happened, how the strategy works in the case where we're actually looking at special points, if we were dealing with CM points. How does the strategy work in this case? Well, we want to go to some setting where we can apply the pillow wilkie counting. To do that, we want to play the algebraic structures in the upper half plane off of the algebraic structures in the modular curve. What allows us to go between them? Well, the number of theoretic input is that if you have a CM point, it's algebraic both in the upper half plane and in Y1. It also has a very large Galois orbit in the upper half plane, and that allows us to start the whole game. So the issue in this case is that if Z1 is isogenous to Z2 and neither of them are CM, then it's hard to control the Galois orbit, so the degree or the complexity or the height of either of these. So it's hard to say much of anything. I mean, first of all, there, first of all, this will legitimately happen. If you have a curve in two variables, it will intersect like a curve. So there's going to be pairs of points on it, which are isogenous. These points are not gonna be CM. So their pre-image in the upper half plane is gonna be highly transcendental. So you're not gonna get any number theoretic input um, to start. And their height's probably gonna go to infinity. And so it's very hard to sort of get a sense for what's going on. <clears throat> At the very least, what you would want to do is play the, if you have one point, you have many trick from Galois theory. And that's a strategy people sort of are trying to make work, but it's very hard to control the degrees of these points. So that's sort of where the issue is coming in. It is very hard to get any sort of arithmetic from this assumption. And again, this is not a counterfactual. This will legitimately happen if you look at two coordinates at a time. Okay, so oops. what is our approach? So it's a really pretty idea and it's an idea which comes up sort of over and over again um, in this world. And it's where this assumption shows up. So the idea is to look at the heights of these points and play them off against each other. So there's gonna be two primary inputs that are used here. The first observation is to notice that if these degrees are different, then actually the height of the three coordinates are pretty different. So if you look at the height of zi divided by the height of zj, where these are points on the curve now, so they're algebraic points, then this is asymptotic 
to the degree of pi i divided by the degree of pi j. This is not a mysterious fact. It's just a fact about points in, on curves inside the plane, for example. If you have a, a polynomial in two variables, and it's degree 5 in x, and it's degree 7 in y, and you look at very large solutions, then x is going to be correspondingly larger than y in terms of height. OK, so that's the first assumption, is that that's the first observation, is that if our degrees are different, we can create the sort of imbalance in the height. Okay. All right. So I'm going to say more about the height function uh, in a second. I just want to keep this a little informal. And the second observation, this is a very serious input, is that isogenous points of low complexity have similar heights. So I'll explain how that works um, shortly. But isogeny orbits of elliptic curves or in fact the billion varieties are finite if you look over a fixed number field. So it's a priori not so surprising to expect something like this. In any case, I'll say in a minute precisely uh, what's true here. But then the idea is you play these two off of each other. You say, well, the heights aren't similar. They're pretty different, right? If these two are, if these two are different. Remember, this is logarithmic height. So if this is like, uh, t to the five, this is like t to the seventh in terms of sort of classical height. On the other hand, they don't have similar height, so they must not have low complexity. And from this, we're gonna get the one to many trick to work. We're gonna show that high complexity means you have a high degree. Okay, so that's a sketch. Let's make it more precise. And let's dive a little bit deeper into how height functions work here, how we're going to measure complexity in this setup. <clears throat> so one very natural height function is you can look at the usual height of, um, well, okay, height of the Jane variant of an elliptic curve. Let's think of the modular curve as a moduli space of elliptic curves. That elliptic curve is a Jane variant. It's a perfectly good coordinate uniformizer. That's got a classical height. I know we didn't delve super deep into what heights of algebraic numbers are, but again, if it's a rational number, it's just numerator and denominator complexity. In general, it's a little bit more complicated. But we have this height. Um, it behaves reasonably well, so it will certainly satisfy one. just for sort of general, that's how heights work reasons um, on varieties. You can think about this as if you look at the pullback of 001, of 01 from the compactification of the modular curve uh, and you compare them one to the power of this would be the other to the power of this. But regardless, this satisfies one, but it's a little bit arbitrary. So the J function is something we're all used to seeing, but it's not really a special coordinate on the modular curve. You can pick other coordinates, you can add one to this, you can take a fractional linear transformation of this. Um, and so the fact that it's arbitrary means you're gonna get sort of bounded factors of O of one everywhere. And that's not very good for this kind of analysis. We want something more precise. So instead, we're gonna use something called the faultings height of the elliptic curves, which faultings also introduced, well, I assume he introduced this precisely for the same reason that he has finer control over how it behaves. So what is the faultings height? Let me give just a, a special case. For simplicity, let's assume our elliptic curve is over Q. And let's say it has good reduction everywhere. Which I think never happens, but let's ignore that. <laughs> the fact that things are impossible should not stop us. And let's take omega to be um, a differential form, which is uh, generating over Z. So 
So it's a differential form which behaves well periodically at every prime p. If you have bad reduction, you use narrowing differentials. I mean, there's ways to get around it. We're really not cheating in any special way here. Then the fault things height, what you do up to a factor, I'm probably gonna screw it up, but essentially you take the log of the integral over the complex points of your elliptic curve of omega wedge omega bar. Maybe there's some, I guess I put up with value, so I'm okay. So it's something like this. <clears throat> okay, so what is the um, point of this? Well, first of all, if you sort of, well, first of all, it's, it's, it's more canonical. It doesn't rely on J function. You can see that it's sort of a more inherent to the elliptic curve. Second of all, it's taking all places into account, like a good height function should. It's taking the Archimedean place into account because we're doing this integral over the complex points. And it's taking the finite places into account because we want our W to sort of generate over all ZP, all theatics. And because of the way it's defined, it behaves much nicer under isogenies, which is something that even without understanding exactly what's going on here, you can sort of intuitively see. If I take an isogeny, I can sort of reuse the same differential. This is gonna change a little bit, so it will give me some multiplicative factor. And then at the primes, I'm, only, I'm gonna get some other factor because I have to scale it up or down to sort of account for it, not generating anymore. This behaves in a precise way under isogenies. That's sort of the key fact from the perspective of these kind of problems and from the perspective of what fault things needed it for, through the Mordell conjecture, that's really the thing which comes into play. So concretely, the thing we're gonna use is if you have an isogeny between two elliptic curves, U1 to E2, you can compare the difference in their faultings heights extremely precisely. So you can write down an actual equality that involves some complicated terms. So instead, we'll use the following precise inequality that the faultings height of one curve Maybe it's, it doesn't matter in this case, I guess. Uh, is at most the faulting is height of the other plus log of the degree of this f. Now, if we were to use the j function instead of the faulting is height, if we were to use this height function, then for every degree, if you fix a degree here, degree of f, so you've just looked at like five isogenies, you would still have an inequality here with an O of one factor. Then you'd have to work really hard to understand what that is. I'm not actually personally sure what it is. Um, and if we're going to do this kind of analysis, we sort of have to consider all isogenies at once. That's why you need a more sort of canonical definition to handle, to get this sort of uniformity control. Okay, and finally, if you use the Falkings height instead of the height of the J value, um, it's, it's actually not that big of a difference. So if you look at the difference between the faultings height and the usual height of the J invariant, it's bounded by some constant times log of the faultings height. Put a plus one here just to be safe that I don't have negative infinities anywhere. So okay, it's something a little bit technical because there's a cusp in the modular curve is the problem. There's some generation happening here, but in terms of like things going to infinity and how fast they grow, this is pretty good. If one of them is going to infinity, then so is the other one at a pretty comparable pace. Okay. So that's a bit of a digression into arithmetic geometry. <clears throat> and now the major input we'll need is a theorem of Messer and Wurstholz. Which, so we've explained one already, or at least I, I told you that one is true for sort of general reasons. What about this two? This two is given in a very nice, very useful form by a theorem of Messer and Wurstholz, which says that if E1 and E2 are two elliptic curves which are isogenous, then there actually exists an isogeny of pretty small degree. So let N be the minimum degree of an isogeny between E1 and E2. 
you would sort of expect if E1 and E2 were pretty simple and isogenous for the smallest isogeny to also be pretty simple, or at least you would naively guess that. And the result is that N is bounded above by the maximum of the height of E1 and the degree of E1 Uh, this is the faulting side. Thank you. Although I guess it doesn't matter, actually. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. But I mean the faulting side. <clears throat> the power of big O of one. And in this case, in fact, you can show, I mean, this has been worked on for a while. Pilarin showed you can take five over here. There's some more precise stuff, but we're going to use this very robust form. Okay, so now this is exactly measuring complexity in the sense we're used to, right? How can a number be complicated? Over and over again, we see that it's either through the height being complicated, so the number being big in terms of our comedian size or denominators, or the degree being large. That also means your number is complicated. So you take the complexity of just one of these, either E1 or E2, and you raise it to some power, and that's going to be this N. Right, exactly what I was going to say. So it's very crucial to have a good, to a good dependence on this because we're exactly going to use this kind of thing to show that if you have one point satisfying something, you have many such points. How are we going to do that? We're exactly going to do that by getting a lower bound on the degree. Okay? All right, so this is also true for abelian varieties. National and Votes have a series of papers. I think they have five papers on this. Um, uh, culminating in sort of this general statement. Yes, they're completely effective. Um, they use transcendental number theory. So in a nutshell, um, there's many people here who understand this better than me, but in a nutshell, you sort of make a large polynomial in a bunch of theta functions or wire stress functions, uh, which has a large degree zero. That's right, your geometric uh, upper bound. And then you get an arithmetic lower bound, you conclude somehow using that. <clears throat> um, they're extremely effective. And in some sense, uh, they're used to give another proof of the Mordell conjecture using this theorem, or at least a big, a big part of it. Because a big, a big part of Faulting's proof is to show that isogeny orbits are finite. And this immediately tells you isogeny orbits are finite. If something's in the isogeny orbit of E1, all you gotta do is consider isogenies up to this degree. Check them all, that's a finite number. Okay. All right. So this is a very important ingredient. Um, maybe I'll leave this up just so we remember our definitions of rank. <clears throat> it's a very important ingredient used in sort of many different ways for problems like this, many settings. Um, okay. So, let's use it now in the context we're interested in to show some kind of, if we have one point, we have many points trick. <clears throat> so, let's say we're in um, case, uh, case one over here. We have a point on C with all three of these um, isogenous. Yes. Oh, um, you, you, sorry, that's a good point. Um, it, it, it doesn't actually, am I fully lying? No, I'm not. It, it doesn't matter. So if C is not defined over Q bar, then this will just never happen because you're intersecting with, uh, with algebraic, am I just fully lying? I haven't thought this through, so give me one minute. Can you specialize it though? Is that true though? But why are these algebraic though? They're isogenous, but why is any one of them defined over Q bar? Yeah, but C, I think what Jinbo was saying is that if C is not defined over Q bar, 
But what, I still don't see why this is defined over Q bar, though. I don't think that's clear. Because you could have. This is many diagonals. Each of them is the second point. It's the. Is it anyway? C contains uh, a sub team. Even in many points, you might But this, I, I, I'm not. Yeah, I'm not convinced in case one that that's true. Let me say yes for now. You think it's true? Okay. Um, yeah, there is. I, th I think you're right. I think, I think the specialization argument works. That's right. But I, I did overlook that point. Let's stick to C over Q bar. And I'm, I'm pretty sure, and people here are more sure, that you can make it work over C. But let me work over Q bar. <clears throat> In any case, the proof to C will first involve doing it over Q bar and then specializing. So let's stick to the Q bar setting. Okay. Um, okay. So in case one, let's assume that Z1 is isogenous to Z2 by an isogeny of uh, degree N. Then we're going to conclude that the degree of Z1 over Q <clears throat> is at least N to the delta for some delta bigger than zero. <clears throat> okay? And that will enable us to start the argument. So uh, let's prove this. Oh, it's very large. Let's go over here. Okay, let's start off by assuming that's not true. Not by the way, since our points don't have CM, um, then uh, this N is essentially unique. So there's no need to fuss over the, over the minimality over there. For abelian varieties, the minimality is much more crucial. For elliptic curves, it's, it's less of a big deal. Though for CM elliptic curves, it's still interesting. Okay, so suppose not. <clears throat> so in other words, suppose you have some sequence where this degree, yeah, that's right. So exists a delta. I'm gonna give an explicit delta. <laughs> it's not mysterious. Uh, suppose not, or the argument will, sorry, I will. The reason I wanna state it this way is because if it's not true, then the degree you can assume is not faster than the power. So I can take a subsequence where it's slower than every power and to the little of one. Okay, and assume without loss generality that the degree of pi one is less than, is, uh, sorry, bigger than the degree of pi two. So that the height of Z two is bigger than the height of Z one. Okay, so let's recall what's happening. N is less, I'm just rewriting master host holtz over there than the max of the height and the degree to the power of O of one. Now this term is small by assumption. So this guy is not gonna do the job. Therefore, this guy has to do the job. So N is bounded by the height of Z one to the O of one. Okay, so now we're gonna recall what's true. So first of all, if you look at this ratio times the height of uh, Z1, then this is comparable. So it's, it's um, I'll say less than or equal to a small fudge factor times the height of Z2. This is by property one down here. Um, boop, 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 boop. Yep. Now the height of Z2 and the height of Z1 aren't actually all that different. This is less than or equal to the same small fudge factor times the height of Z1 
plus log m by this property over here. D1 and D2 can't actually have very different heights. <clears throat> um, but log n, n is smaller than the power of H of Z1. So log n is not going to hold much of a candle to H of Z1 itself. Uh, this is pi 2 pi 1, is that right? No, but see, it's always a mistake to write things down. Um, no, 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 no. Hold on, hold on, hold on. You're right, you're right, you're right. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is flipped, right? This is, I think this is right. I think this is just what's true. Height of Z, yeah, this is what's true. That's right. Because if you look at x to the 5 equals y to the 7, 5 times the height of x is 7 times the height of y. Great. Right, right, right. <clears throat> okay. Um, and this is a contradiction. Now, why is it a contradiction? In principle, it might not be if the height of z1 were also small, but it can't be small. We already know that it's growing pretty fast compared to n. So it's going to infinity, and you get it times something more than 1 is at most it. Okay, any questions about, about this argument? It's a little bit subtle, but this kind of argument is used, like literally this kind of argument is used all over the place. That if things are close, they have fairly similar height. On the other hand, you understand the height pretty well from the algebra. And then if you know that things are isogenous via a large degree isogeny, you know the Galois orbits are big. Okay. I, I was, yeah, you can see from here what delta is. Delta is one over this number, so you can get a fifth because you only need to get rid of this guy for it to work. <clears throat> All right. So what now? Well, now we're sort of in a, in a pretty good place. I'm focusing, I'll mention case two at the end. It's very, very similar. Um, we know that if we have this kind of situation where we have points where all three coordinates are isogenous, then in fact, we have sort of many such points. But let's think about what many means, right? In the previous case, in the CM context, we measured their complexity with respect to the actual point. We had some CM point, it had some height, or its pre imaging upper half plane had some height. And so then we defined some fundamental set in the upper half plane. We got many rational points, and we can start our argument. In this case, we can't really do that we still understand the point zi way too poorly. First of all, Piliwoki is for rational points, and our point zi is going to have very high degree. And even with the recent improvements, that's sort of not, it's not feasible to approach it um, that way. And secondly, our many isn't with respect to the heights of these points, with respect to this number n. So if you think about it, the argument we need now has to take place not inside the modular curve or the upper half plane, it has to take place inside of the world of isogeny, right? So how do we make that happen? <clears throat> yes. This here? That's a little, this one? <laughs> this one here? It's just, you can take it to be five. Log n is like bounded by five times log this, I guess. But it's log, right? And log, yeah, <laughs> that's the point. No, no, of course. <clears throat> yeah, it's kind of funny. I, I tried, um, it doesn't mean it's impossible, but, but I, I, I tried to get this argument to work in the torus case, because I thought it'd be easier to present the torus framework, it's more convenient. But I don't think anything like this is true in the torus case that I could think of for any kind of analog. Of, you can think of isogeny as being like power dependent, like x to the rational powers is isogenous to x. And you can try doing some analog, but this is somehow a very strong property. I don't know. It's something which is true in the, in the modular case that at least I can't think of an analog for it in the, um, in the multiplicative case. 
And it's precisely for this reason that log is much smaller than powers that this is a sort of useful. Um, okay. <clears throat> Another, I'll just, I can't resist mentioning this. Um, we had to work out a piatic version of this in the latest um, Andre Yurt thing in order to sort of make canonical heights. And piatically, you, do, you don't have this log singularity. Everything just works well over the link of activification. Um, so it's really some kind of genuinely real property that I don't really understand. Um, I'm sure people out there understand it better. Okay, so. You can show it's big. You don't have to worry about it being small. Yeah, that's true. That's often the case. I think in this case, it's actually not such a big deal because you can immediately get lower bounds for it, but often it is a big deal. Right. In, in general, you don't. Yes, that's right. <clears throat> yeah, so, high, so the cusps can often help. Um, they do hurt more frequently, though, but you're right. You're right that they can help as well. All right. So now let's define some set in order to apply uh, the Pili-Wilkie bounds to. Let's sort of realize our unlikeliness. So we're going to define a set. It's going to be inside the fundamental domain cross GL2R squared. This is the kind of thing you have to start doing to tackle the zilberpink pink conjecture to go beyond Andre Ward. So how is this defined? Well. It's going to be triples of points, Z, G1, and G2, such that Z, G1 acting on Z, and G2 acting on Z. No, no, I haven't. I just. I'm not assuming Andre Yort. I'm just, I, I just want to illustrate something. I, I, did, I didn't mention it though during the lectures. No, no, I mentioned it during the lectures. You were here when I mentioned it. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna defend myself. <laughs> um, in any case, I am gonna continue with the current lecture. <laughs> um, all right. So we're going to look at triples where our first point is going to denote the coordinate in the fundamental domain. And what are these G1s and G2s doing? Well, the point is that if something is isogenous on the modular curve, that's realized upstairs in the upper half plane by there being a rational matrix, which takes one point to the other. Okay? So this is the set that's going to have many points. Right, because, sorry, because, well, I mean, I'm a subset, right? So I can do whatever I want. I can make it bigger and nothing's gonna change. You're right, in principle, they're gonna be positive determinants. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can restrict to a very much smaller set here, but it doesn't actually affect the argument. <clears throat> so now the point is that uh, if you look at the number of rational points, um, no, sorry. So one more thing. So what we want to claim is that this has many rational points, right? Because we know that if we want isogenies of relatively small degree, say degree bounded by N, then we know there's many such guys, right? So that means there's many of these G1s and G2s. But again, we have no control on the Z, just like before. So how do we get rid of this? Well, we look at the projection. Uh, onto the last two variables. And so we know there's some Z and we're gonna say that pi of S has many rational points. It's 
So ultimately, the set we're looking at exists entirely in the group. We're looking at pairs of matrices, two by two matrices, such that there exists a Z, such that the Z times G1 and times G2, all three of these are in the curve. Okay. Not by the way, already here, if we were working with two variables, not just one, so why do we need Z1, G2, and G3? Let's just work with Z1 and Z2 and have a Z1 and a G1 here. Then pi of S is going to be everything that will have learned nothing. Okay. Which is reminiscent of the fact that rank one on if we were inside Y1 squared would be a generic condition. It would not be unlikely. This is unlikely. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> All right. So we're almost there where we can apply something. Almost to the point we can apply some sort of Pillar Wilkie statement. So there's another hiccup to go around, which is nice because it leads us to another piece of nice mathematics. Um, what does Pillar Wilkie in the form I presented it actually say? Well, what Pillar Wilkie says is if we look at the set pi of s and we remove the algebraic part, then there are very few rational points left, right? I'm sorry? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. So this is, uh, this is J inverse of C. That's right. I want J of this to be in C. That's what I want. Yeah, yeah, you're right. This is taking place in the upper half plane. Okay, the problem here is that pi of S as a set, its algebraic part is going to be everything. So Pillar Wilkie is going to be a contentless statement. Why is it going to be everything? Because points have stabilizers. So if I have a single triple Z, G1, and G2, what I can do is I can take G1 and I can multiply it on the right by any element which stabilizes Z. That's going to give me an algebraic curve. And so that'll be removed when I take the algebraic part. And so Pillar Wilkie is going to be empty. It's going to be a contentless statement. So what we need is a stronger statement that Pili Wilkie, in fact, also proved that I want to describe, which tells you how to get around this kind of property. So <clears throat> let's talk about strong Pili Wilkie. Here's an, yeah. Yeah, it is. It is. Okay. Mm -hmm. Might be like minusculely different, but it's, it's, it's the same ideas. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's, I think it's the only proof I know. Yeah. Um, okay, so what's one example? I think a very illustrative example is to look at x equals y times 2 to the z. Let's call this our set S inside our cube. Now, S alge is just S, because if I fix a Z, I get a line, lines are algebraic, so S alge is just, is just S. Okay, however, that's sort of not the point of the set, right? The set is transcendental, and it's transcendental in the Z. So let's say I want to count points of height up to T. Well, okay, they're all contained inside algebraic curves, so that's fine. On the other hand, if I look at S of Z or S of Q or whatever, this is contained in very few lines. Just given by you fix a, an integer Z, that gives you a line. Um, that gives you a bunch of points. And all the points, that gives you many, many points, like polynomially many points. So you can't see anything there. However, you need very few lines in order to account for all the points, logarithmically many. And that suggests the kind of thing that you should in general look for. Okay, if you have a large algebraic part, if you're a fibration or something more complicated, um, then it's not enough to just say, remove the algebraic part, that's already very contentful, but you can ask for more. You can say, well, okay, if I have an algebraic part, there should be a very controlled way to sort of account for it, such that once I get rid of it, then I have very few points left. Another example, by the way, um, 
because this one might be a little too clean. I mean, all you do is look at a fixed family, the family of lines, and you remove some. So you might think maybe that's all I have to do. But another example that I find very illustrative is x equals y to the z inside s. This is different now. Once again, I'm looking at uh, rational number z here. Those give me algebraic curves. But as I take different rational numbers, the degree varies, right? If z equals five over seven, the degree is seven and so on. <clears throat> so they don't come from a single algebraic family. So let's look at what's true over here. S has many points. Where do the points all come from? Where in S is S of Z or S of Q? Okay, well, first of all, we have Z equals zero and Z equals one. These give us lines. This gives us a T, let's say, let's say S of Z just for simplicity. Um, so, uh, I'm kind of integer points. Um, I, I'm just going to count them on the reals. That should be fine. Uh, yeah, I'm about to say, about the, uh, in the box, absolutely, yeah. So you get roughly t points of size at most t. I'm looking at integer points to simplify. Okay, if I remove these lines though, I still have points less, but I have fewer. I now have square root many points. Where do the square root many points come from? They come from z is plus and minus one half and plus and minus two. This gives us quadratics. I guess quadratics maybe they're called in this case. And this gives me square root t points of size at most t. Now I'm left with t to the one third many points or t to the, yeah, I think t to the one third. Now, I can keep going and I can remove more and more algebraic curves to get below lower and lower powers of T. Absolutely, that's examples of the Lombieri, 100%. Um, wait, but for, with all of the moving? The, the, the flavor, the flavor is here, absolutely. 100%, yes, the, the flavor is there. Um, Okay, so motivated by these two examples, let's give a couple of definitions. So first a definable block W in some Rn of degree D and dimension W is a definable, connected, irreducible set uh, of dimension D, of dimension, sorry, W, such that if I look at the Zariski closure of W, its dimension is the same as the dimension of W and its, uh, and its degree is D. What's the idea? This is basically saying take a semi algebraic chunk of some given dimension and some given degree, but then you're allowed to take some basically open set inside it in a definable way. So, one example is you can look at like x equals y is less than or equal to e to the z. Right? This is going to be a dimension two thing. It's going to be basically semi algebraic because the only condition here is x equals y in terms of a closed condition. But then we're allowed to take some definable subset of it without changing the dimension. Okay, that's a definable block. And then a block family W in Rn cross Rm of degree D and some dimension W is once again, you want it to be definable, connected, irreducible, such that WY for every Y is a definable block. 
just a way to talk about families of a given complexity. <clears throat> okay, so the theorem here, this is strong pillow Wilkie, is suppose I have an X in R to the N definable in some O minimal structure. Now for this theorem, I got to fix an epsilon ahead of time. Excuse me. I got to fix some number epsilon. And if I were to see why, the same reason as here. If I want to tell you which power of T I want to go below, then I can tell you which algebraic things to remove. So I'm going to fix an epsilon. And then there are finitely many definable block families. Wi inside Rni cross Rmi and uh, and some constant C of x comma epsilon such that if I look at all the rational points inside x of height at most t. then they're contained in C of X epsilon, T to the epsilon blocks WI fibered over some point contained in X. In other words, there's finitely many families of algebraic things, for example, like lines, quadrics, whatever, or maybe definable sort of pieces of them, such that all the rational points are contained in only this many such families. So not only is everything contained in an algebraic thing, but if you're stratified by algebraic guys like that, you don't need that many algebraic things to take care of all rational points. This is an important strengthening um, of Pilawoki because in this case, you can sort of cheat. I mean, this is kind of a false example because this fibers over x over y equals two to the z, that's transcendental, just apply pili wilkie there, right? What's the big deal? But with an example like this, you can't really do that. So sometimes you stratify by algebraic things in ways that are genuinely not a fibration. And then this kind of improvement is genuinely important. Okay. <clears throat> so finally, let's go over here. No, I'm actually pretty sure that this is the version they naturally get and then deduce their main one. Because if you work with just the remove everything thing uh, version, the induction is not really doable because you do have rational points get account for, you need some uniformity. Yeah, this is how you get it. <clears throat> though, I, though I think maybe Pila had to work a little bit to get it in this kind of nice format so we can, we can apply it. Like I think this first appeared in his paper on Andre Yort for X1 to the N, this exact formulation. <clears throat> okay, um, so we have our pi s here. No, exactly. That's very, it's a very good point. So if you have no algebraic part, for example, then all the blocks are just points. And then this literally says you have t to the epsilon points of height at most t, right? So it's a very nice way of sort of taking it all into account. I'm pretty sure they worked really hard to get all the phrasing super clean. By now they're super clean, but I think the journey to get there was, was very difficult. Um, okay, so we have this set pi of s. It has many rational points. So now we can just quote Pila Wilkie. It's true for any set. We know that all these points lie in few algebraic pieces. So pi of s has many points, rational points in few algebraic pieces. So now we're just gonna rule out these algebraic pieces. So let me do this part a little bit quickly. So suppose that um, D is some one variable thing. In pi of S, 
is algebraic. What does that mean from the definition of S? It means there exists some Z such that Z, G times Z, H of Z is in C. That means there exists some definable, I'll say F of T in the upper half plane, such that if I look at the curve F of T, G of T times F of T, and H of T times F of T, this is contained or is essentially equal to J inverse C. Now this F is just definable. It's not anything we can really control or say anything about. But G and... Yeah, there's some definable choice thing happening here that I'm skimming over. <clears throat> F is definable, but the G and H are algebraic. So the transcendence degree here, instead of coming from three things, is really coming from two things. So this has transcendence degree at most two. That means it's contained at some algebraic surface, but that's a contradiction by our functional transcendence result. So I'm skipping a few details, but the point is that you get that this is a point, then you show that can't account for all the rational points, you do some cleanup work, but that's the idea. And in the case two, where one of them was CM and the other two were isogenous, it's the exact same sort of story. You keep track of the complexity through the isogeny of the other two, as well as through the usual CM complexity um, of your point. So um, I'm essentially out of time. I just want to mention that at the moment when uh, there's sort of the zero pin conjecture, even the one I wrote down here for curves, but you can go more generally to surfaces and such. And the argument is pretty well spelled out in terms of what it should be. But the thing blocking us are really these arithmetic bounds, are the Galois bounds, which would pretty much be enough, but then also the height bounds, which seem to be sort of intimately related. And in cases where you can play these sort of tricks, coming from isogeny estimates, this kind of arithmetic, you can get started. Um, but beyond that, we're a little bit stuck. Um, there's a few partial other ideas, but this is where the main sort of breaking point is. Okay, I was gonna do two other examples, but our time has run dry. So thank you very much. <laughs> I do them. I can mention them briefly. Um, the two examples I was going to mention were first one is my favorite problem, which is the um, abelian varieties not isogenous to a Jacobian. So there's a result of uh, Master and Zanier, where, I mean, there's original work in CM points by Chai and Urt myself. But Mashmanzani have this paper that show that most uh, abelian varieties over essentially Q, I'll say what this means in a second, are not isogenous to a Jacobian. Why do I say essentially Q? Well, because there just aren't that many abelian varieties over Q. Conjecturally, they all lie in some weird space and stuff. So this is kind of a weird thing to prove. So instead they take some map to PN in order to talk about being defined over Q. But otherwise, they prove this. And it's a very similar construction where they show that if you're isogenous, then by the isogeny bounds, you have a high degree. Then you become isogenous to many points. And sufficiently many points, you can get something algebraic in there. You use the function of transcendence, and boom, you're done. Um, that was the first example I was going to explain. And the second example I was going to explain was the result of Pila and myself, and there's previous work of Boehm and Poonen, uh, which I really like, which says the, the incompatibility, it's an incompatibility result between the modular structure and the elliptic curve additive structure. So it says if you look at, I don't know, for example, if you take a curve inside like, let's say the modular curve cross an elliptic curve, you look at, for example, CM points here, and here you fix some finitely generated group gamma, and you ask, can this curve contain infinitely many of these? Um, 
the answer is no, and you can show it using, using these kind of methods, and you sort of need a bit of a different transcendence approach I was going to mention, but it's the same kind of concept. The trick is always how to set up something somewhere where you can apply Pila Wilkie. How can you get many of something to apply this kind of thing? I really like this problem because Boehm and Poonen have a beautiful measure theoretic argument using equidistribution, uh, which works in almost all cases. It doesn't work for a correspondence between the Shimura curve and an elliptic curve, but the argument is super clean. Uh, that's what motivated me to work on this problem. So I, in an ideal world, they would have explained their argument and our argument. So that's what I was going to mention. And the modularity conjecture, another I know of. There's some relation between it and non-vanishing of central values of L functions. Um, so using this kind of result, you can show some non-vanishing, but it's not strong enough to be interesting, unfortunately. Um, well, I thought, I thought Zilber didn't phrase it this way. I thought Zilber phrased it in like a model theoretic language due to his like three trichotomy conjecture. Starting from there, he made some formulation and then Pink came at it from a much more concrete, less intersection, more varieties with things approach. Yeah, but does it state this conjecture in this form? I thought, I thought it like dances around it, but it doesn't state it in this form, I think is why it's called Zilber Pink. Oh, instead of Pink, Zilber is your question. <laughs> right. Okay, yeah, that's, no, no, no. Oh boy, you're right, you're right, you're right. Why is it Zilber Pink given that Z is after P is the question. Yeah, that's not. <laughs> It's, there's no, yeah. I, I think it's just because Zilber pink rolls off the tongue better, but, but uh, I, I don't know, yeah. I don't know and, and, and counsel advice, I'm going to, uh, sorry? <laughs> right, right. I should ask if there's any questions from the sky, from our Zoom audience. Any questions? Okay. It's very cool listening to people speak. So it's extra incentive. We'll be very grateful if you have a question, just so we can hear the thunderous voice. Not today. Okay. Let's thank the chat. Great.